Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Man on the Move, at least in your picture frame, Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. Trying to get myself a little more centered tonight. Last night I was kind of snuggling up next to you in the split screen. On the big screen, the differences don't look very big, but when you cut uh, it in half, all of a sudden it doubles the, the error. And I see. Anyway, got it somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. How are you doing tonight? Enjoy that game? I did. What did you think of it, Bruce? I liked it a lot. 7-4 Oilers win the mm-hmm. uh, against the first place uh, Vegas Golden Knights. It was a game that the Oilers came to dominate. It was even 3-3 three, three, um, until uh, midway through the second period when the Oilers just exploded. The grade-A shots were 18 for Edmonton, 10 for Vegas. The subset of five alarm shots, which are even more dangerous, were 10 for Vegas and seven for the Oilers. So we, we, I tracked, excuse me, is it? Yeah, I gotta work these off. I just gotta fix this. Sorry, I'm just fixing our scoring chance document. Um, I, yeah. All, five, all 10 of uh, Vegas shots were grade A's, according to uh, my initial assessment. You're going to go over it tomorrow, and we'll see if, if yeah. that stands. But, um, yeah, an interesting game, Bruce. It, you know, it, 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 had the ba- it had a bad feeling initially, but it got better. Let's do our Two Good Things, Two Bad Things, and Two Numbers podcast. And because it was a big Oilers win, we'll go with Two Good Things each. What is your first good thing? Yeah, uh, my first thing tonight is going to be Ryan Nugent Hopkins, who uh, for the second time in his career and the first time in almost 12 years scored five points in a game. He did it in game 19 of his uh, rookie season, November of 2011, on Hockey Night in Canada with a five-assist effort in a 9-2 beatdown of the Chicago Blackhawks. And this was the pinnacle of... Uh, the Nuge rookie season where we thought we had a real phenom yeah. uh, on our hands and a scoring one. And he was scoring that year until he uh, he tripped over the blue line in Chicago uh, uh, a couple months later and injured his shoulder on the boards. And I think that shoulder has never been perfect since then. Apparently he wears an ice bag on it after every game. Uh, anyway, uh, tonight was game number 794. And for just the second time in that uh, uh, fine and becoming much finer career of his, uh, he notched five points in a single game. In fact, he had the five by the end of the second period before calling off the dogs. So we can find it. uh, uh, Bouchard from Nugent Hopkins, primary assist on the power play. Then we had uh, uh, Nugent Hopkins unassisted to put Edmonton ahead. Dry nice settle, shot, nice oh, shot. Beautiful top corner, 35th of the season. Dry settle from McDavid and Nugent Hopkins on the power play. Uh, uh, and then we had uh, Nurse from Fogel and Nugent Hopkins, even strength. And finally, Hyman from McDavid and Nugent Hopkins on the power play. So three points on Edmonton's three power plays. Uh, they only had three power plays tonight, two minutes and 55 seconds, in which they scored three times and allowed one. But uh, the special teams was a big, big deal on this road trip. And uh, uh, I think five for seven between the two nights, and one of the two that failed was a three-second long power play due to an overlap, so technically a power play, but really one with no chance to, to score. And they've just been uh, dynamite. The puck's been on a string for those guys. Holy moly, is that puck zipping around the zone. And Nuge is a huge part of it, you know, and he's he's a big part of the reason the power play is even better this year than before because he's doing more things. Like it used to be he was playing mainly on the left wing and he was doing, you know, nifty stuff, don't get me wrong. The behind the back pass, he'd make back to Barry at the point to set up the pass going the other way. But now he's doing more stuff from the middle of the ice, and he's turning up in the middle. And uh, he's off in the middle man where, say, McDavid will dig the puck out from him from one corner into the middle slot, and, and Nuge will just one-touch it over to that right circle, and 
dry settle will lash it in. I mean, how many times have we seen that goal this year? And he's just, uh, uh, he's always been uh, what was called, I think Tyler Dello, who originally called him a, a power play witch. And he was that, certainly even in Red Deer, when I was scouting all those games he played in Red Deer there in his draft year. And he was dynamite on the power play then, and he remains. But he's just becoming so much more of a complete, highly skilled, accomplished player. And he's winning more of his battles. He's, uh, you know, he's just fully engaged. And I think we've, we're finally seeing him at the near the height of his powers. I mean, he's still getting better, so maybe there's another step to come. But uh, what a great player we got now. 96 points on the season, and all of a sudden it looks like 100 points is... Uh, is uh, uh, almost certain to come. You know, four more Oilers power plays is all it's really going to take, right? <laughs> I like you. I like how greedy you are there, Bruce. That you want him to even get better than this. I like that. Yeah. That's it. Why not? It's, why not? He's been better in the second half than he was in the first. I say. And he's yeah. had a great year the whole time. You know, so. I remember when he was first moved um, to play on the left half wall mm-hmm. on this power play. When he is a rookie, when he was so good in the power play, as I recall, he was setting up. He was on the the right dot, setting up on. He was setting up there, and consistently setting up Jordan Everly for yeah. um, for some really well, nice calls. They really had a lot of chemistry, yeah. and then the opposition learned to shut that down, and it went away. And um, it's funny. I just when he was first moved to the left half wall, um, I wasn't that optimistic about it because I I like having off wing shooters on those two dots. And I'm thinking, how's this going to work? I mean, he's he he isn't much of a shooter, and he's you know he's not it's not going to help that he's not on his off wing, and it doesn't necessarily even help his passing, although he's able to puck protect a little bit better, and win pucks on the board a little bit better over on that side, mm-hmm. which I think is an advantage that he takes advantage of, and what he's done uh, to shut up big blabbermouth me. Um, is continually improve his game since he's been in that spot, as you're suggesting, Bruce. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it's an improvement um, in tactics and intensity. I would say, you know, he as you as you just pointed out, he moves around the ice. He moves to the high slot where he's really dangerous because of his his such depth passing. And and what you notice with all the passes tonight, they're often second assists, mm-hmm. or sometimes second assists, but does he ever put it right on those guys' stick? And does he ever pass it hard? It's hard, right on the stick. Boom, right on the stick. And that makes such a difference. If a player gets that pass in stride right on his stick, that's that's the key. And yeah. he, um, the intensity part of it, so the tactics, he's moving around more. He's, he's uh, I think he has developed a better shot. That there, There's no doubt some amount of puck luck in his high he's, goal scoring this year. Letting it go faster. Yeah, part he's, of it. yeah, he's getting it. He's figured out, I think, how to score goals. He's thinking about it, just like McDavid did. Mm-hmm. I think he and McDavid had a think this summer. Maybe they had a little uh, uh, summit, you know, some high, you know, some luxury resort in the uh, Okanagan or something like that. And they, they got together and talked about how to score more goals. It's, it, I think it worked because they're both um, shooting more often moving into the middle of the ice both of them to shoot more we see that mm-hmm. from mcdavid and we see that from Regent hopkins so there there has been this increase in skill increase in be- better tactics and then the 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 third thing which is the the most obvious difference and something we only saw in certain games you know people um the early comparison for Regent hopkins was well i hope he can develop into like a player like pavel datsuk mm-hmm. people would say and and you know we all had that hope but pavel datsuk was a demon on the ice, was a strong stick who battled incredibly hard. Mm-hmm. And in strong. the end, I just thought, that's not going to, like, you just, I just don't, I, I wish that aspect of Nugent Hopkins was there. I wish he was that player and dug in as hard as Pavel Datsuk, but I don't see it. Um, and um, until this year, and we saw it in a few games, often in playoff games, in a big playoff game now and then it would come through where he would suddenly, like, who is this Nugent Hopkins? You know, he's really digging in. And the uh, mandatory 19 sports reference player that I've always thought of him and compared to him in my mind is Davey Keon, um, who really dug in, who really hustled and and was a very, uh, never took penalties, 
but was a very determined and gritty hockey player. And I thought, where is that, like a Nugent Hopkins game? Well, here it is this year. He battles hard. He doesn't back down, and it's paying off. So good for Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Well, he entered tonight's uh, action in 10th place in the NHL. He's been hovering just inside or outside 10th. And at the end of action tonight, unless there's other NHL games that haven't updated yet, uh, he will move into sixth. Sweet. In the league. He's probably going to finish in the top ten, which would be fantastic. He's probably going to get more than 100 points. Tonight he passed the following players. Elias Patterson, Nathan McKinnon, Mitchell Marner, and the guy who was tied with uh, Jason Robertson. And Sweet. And now... Nuge is on top of all of those guys, at least for now. It, most of them have a game or two in hand because the Oilers have played 75 now. But uh, he's uh, he's uh, just coming on and on, and uh, points totals are going up and up. Yeah, it's nice to see him. These are the Oilers. This is the Oilers team, you know, that I expected to see it from the start of the year and all year long, honestly, like a, a team that could execute like this. And it's, it's very gratifying to see it. Um, happen now this late in the year um first my good thing um leon dreisaitl has i keep saying this he, he for the last month maybe six weeks now he has been a monster at even strength often leading his own line not playing with mcdavid and uh, tonight tonight was was just he dominated this game at even strength um he almost scored really early in the game. The puck came loose to him and this open to him in the slot after quick, a weird quick giveaway. I think it was quick. And um, Yamamoto missed the first chance to capitalize on the open net and then Drysaddle drove it at the net and quick got his stick on it by luck as much as anything. But he was, when it came to his uh, individual contributions to um, major contributions to grade A shots for him and mistakes on grade A shots against, he was plus eight. Four zero against. Not he kept a clean sheet at even strength. Was in on made major contributions to eight um, grade A shots at even strength. You know, off, he was working very well with Evander Kane. Um, he, at even uh, strength eight. At even strength eight, Bruce. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Plus and a few eight, more eight. on the power play, including yeah. his goal, of course. Yeah. Yeah. On the so um, that was a that was a beautiful goal. Um, that was. Uh, one of the Nugent Hopkins passes, I believe, and McDavid uh, made the centering pass to yeah. Dreisaitl, who who pounded it in the net. I think that's his. Nugent fired the diagonal seed right through the right through the slot onto McDavid's tape, and then McDavid actually had the easier pass of the two to center it to Dreisaitl, and he just pounded it in, and they just made it look ridiculously easy. And his best play of the game comes when, when they're breaking up the ice. He um, he gets a nice, he, he, he's weaving up the ice, uh, confusing the Vegas defender by skating behind him at one point. Puts the puck to Yamamoto. Yamamoto makes a really nice pass back to him. And then Dreisaitl does, you know, he just got voted the best passer in the NHL and he shows why. He makes the pass that, you know, every hockey player on earth wishes he could make. This incredible backhand pass across the seam to Evander Kane. And it is just such, he just fires that that puck um, so fast, so accurately. And I and I just recall again, Bruce, that first time, um, not the first time we'd ever seen Leon Dreisettle, of course, but we saw him in that rookie camp in Jasper in 2015. And I just remember him firing those passes again and again and again in this scrimmage. And just, mm -hmm. I had never seen him uh, play like that before and I thought wow this is this is something special and he has turned out to be just that yeah, I remember seeing him play with Prince Albert I went down to the Centrum in Red Deer to watch the sudden death play-in game in 2014 Leon's draft year I missed his games in Edmonton I thought well, I need to see this guy and then they tied for eighth place with Red Deer and the game was in Red Deer so I went down to watch it and I did a scouting report of Leon that uh, remains one of my proudest works in terms of, of getting a, a grip on the player from uh, his ability to bat down pucks that were aerial passes 
to his pension for staying out too long and making mistakes at the end of shifts. And it was all there, everything but the shot, like that shot, like where that came from, I don't know. But uh, he uh, uh, he was great in that game and sort of as an all situations player for uh, Prince Albert. Uh, he and Josh Morrissey were really the only two legit players they had, but they uh, won going away in Red Deer that night and uh, got rewarded with a first round matchup with the uh, Memorial Cup bound Edmonton Oil Kings. We got to see him a couple more times after that. And I, right away, I'm thinking, geez, I hope Edmonton gets this guy. He is really the goods. And uh, he's. Uh, I guess it was good. Consistently. Very unlucky. Good. Sorry? I guess it was good they drafted him and not Sam Bennett that year. Remember that <sighs> controversy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Although yeah. Sam Bennett has become a good NHL hockey player. Yeah, he's a decent player. I remember Eric Francis, I think it was, thanking Edmonton for not taking Sam Bennett so Calgary could have him. <laughs> so, yeah, sweet. Leon was very... He could have easily had five points himself in this game tonight. Easily. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, he got... Uh, I mean, he won the face-off on the yes. power play goal, and McDavid went back and he touched the puck about one inch to, in the direction yeah. of Bouchard who would have got it anyway. And because of that, McDavid got the secondary assist. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, who cares on, at the one level? Uh, the goal sell is the same no matter who's uh, touched the puck in what order. But uh, uh, he had that one where Quick made the impossible uh, paddle save. <clears throat> and just so many, just very near uh, misses great passes to set uh set guys in or very good shots of his own that just didn't quite didn't quite cash and still you know a very comfortable two-point evening and i do believe no he was named the third star of this game it was nugent hopkins mcdavid and dry saddle and the guy who was going to, who was left out that's going to be my second good thing evander kane and uh, i've been pretty critical of kane lately i don't think he's been playing very well and i've been pointing that out at least that's my take on it uh, uh, but tonight he played very well indeed, and I'm going to point that out. I mean, good on you, Vander Kane. He answered the critics tonight, and he answered with a fine, strong, I thought, two-way performance. I thought he was skating in both directions. He was actually winning some battles in the defensive zone. He doesn't have a, a soft touch, you know, with the puck. He's all about power. Uh, but he, tonight he powered 11 shots on net, 11 shots on goal in one game for a player as a... A uh, remarkable number, but it's pretty close to a season high for any order, I do believe. I remember, I think McDavid had 11, but uh, not sure anybody ever got to 12. And just one of those was able to uh, to beat uh, Jonathan Quick. Uh, you know, there were some good saves in there. I don't know how many grade eight shots you had him down for, but uh, the goal you already described, the great backhand feed from... Uh, Dry saddle off the wing where Kane was involved in the build up, did the give and go, and went hard for the net, just buried that perfect pass. You know, no, nothing left to chance there. And he also had four hits in this game, and I just thought he was a, he was a factor uh, in, you know, the, the best parts of his game were finally on display again. A lot of times lately, we've seen some of, you know, some of his downside, not a lot of the up. But uh, tonight he uh, he was very good indeed, and I'm guessing you graded him an eight for that game. I did, and he had uh, uh, to answer your question. Sure. He had he had three grade A shots on net this game, okay. which is a which is a nice total for any player. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Bruce. He, he, it was funny. Like he has been playing poorly, and mm-hmm. he's been particularly weak on defense. And he and he and, yep. and, but it's funny how there's these searing moments. That just suddenly everyone starts attacking a player, and that was, of course, the overtime goal against the other night um, against yeah. Vegas, right? And Kane blew it. He was yeah. terrible on that play. But suddenly, just it's just like everyone explodes with every this pent up frustration with Kane to the to the extent that some people and I saw this and these you know otherwise otherwise very astute order fans are saying things like I think this contract's a bust. I think that you know that. Uh, Holland blew this one. And it's like, I'm thinking, like, he is coming off two serious and extremely painful injuries, one to his wrist, one to his ribs. He was playing, he played great hockey for the Oilers last season. Mm-hmm. And he signed a contract 
which for a player who who had such a great season was a was I think a remarkable bargain for the Edmonton Oilers. And he, it only came about because of I think still Kane's reputation haunted him, and the market for him wasn't what it what it otherwise would have been. So you have this player who is probably in town on a bargain contract, who has been injured, and yeah, he hasn't been playing well. But let's just how about some patience? Mm-hmm. How about some patience? Just relax. Let's see how it. Let's at least wait till. I would say these two injuries. You could even say, let's wait till early next year, like halfway through next year, before we start to say the contract's a bust. But, you know, there has been signs that he is going to snap out of it quicker than that. He had the three-goal game where we're mm-hmm. suddenly we're thinking, ah, oh, maybe he's going to snap out of it. Here's another game where you're where it's another, you know, in, in a run of bad games, there's been these two real diamonds. This is one of them where you start to, where I'm starting to think, okay, he's up and down, but... We, we know what kind of player he can be. And um, maybe he's going to be that even in these playoffs this year. And the, to win the Cup, the Oilers do need a Vander Kane to be a Vander Kane. And I, I'm going to suggest there's a there's a good ch- there After tonight, I'm a bit more confident. But there, there's a chance he's going to be that player through the playoffs. And um, I'd say it's 50-50, yet, you know, that we're going to see that player consistently, you know, the more dominant Kane that gives the orders there's his you know the swagger so good it's good news yeah well Kane uh tonight he played uh 17 mm-hmm. minutes and the Oilers outshot Vegas 19 to 8 and dry saddle at even strength played 14 minutes and the Oilers outshot Vegas 18 to 4 they were just all over him, and, and Leon was so good defensively in this game, and and uh, Kane was pretty good, and they were, you know, they were just uh, uh, bearing down, and I thought that line was uh, particularly good. My second good thing is another power forward on the order, Zach Hyman. I mean, I could easily pick McDavid, who who was who had a pretty good game too. Um, I gave both players, both McDavid and Hyman, eights, mm-hmm. and I gave Kane an eight, uh, Drysaddle a nine. Um, I call, I'm saying, <laughs> he, you know, the crease area, it looks like a, if you look at it from above, it looks like this little blue house. Well, he is the master of the blue house, Zach Hyman. And on the first Oilers goal, um, he did the, he executed the total eclipse of the sun screen as Evan Bouchard just wired oh. that puck, Denny Puck Van like into the net off the post. It was the kind of goal that the Oilers are going to need to score in the playoffs they're going to need it's it's easier to get that outside shot in the playoffs when when the players are really bearing down on the pk it gets harder to make the cross scene passes as good as the orders are in executing them i mean they will obviously get some of those shots it's just that much harder though when players are recklessly throwing themselves around and getting sticks everywhere so often what's going to be open is that outside shot and it's we're starting to see bouchard get it through and he's starting to score. And this one, though, came in no small part because of that fantastic screen by uh, Zach Hyman, where he was unable, where he was able not to interfere with Jonathan Quick, if you know what I mean. So the goal counted. Uh, yeah. Then he scored a great goal of himself right from the blue paint. And this was just an incredible pass by Connor McDavid, where he, just for a brief moment in time, he just kind of hung with the puck and waited for the Vegas defender to move, and he threaded it through to Hyman, who was in the blue house, and put the puck right in the net. Uh, a very, I think it was the sixth goal for the Oilers, if I'm not mistaken, and um, another power play goal, and uh, a great play by Hyman. Now, he has also been injured and not playing that well, and we've been pointing this out too. But um, I think he's looking a little healthier. He looked mm-hmm. a little, he looked like yeah, he was moving well. Games. More so engaged. Yeah, you can. He just didn't look. He did not look healthy. He wasn't skating freely. He wasn't battling for the puck in that stretch, which lasted for about three weeks, maybe four weeks. Yeah. And now he's back. And um, David, he was the was, lowest graded Oiler in our game in our segment from game sixty-one to seventy. He was the lowest graded forward. I never thought I would see that day. He's wow. always consistently been in sort of in the top five. 
four or it's the top three, you know, but always up there. And we're always giving him, you know, he's always getting an extra plus grade because of his, you know, strong effort. That's sort of been very consistent. I mean, it was yeah. 4.9, but I mean, for Zach Hyman, that's like just way below form. And I think a lot of it was he was fighting through something. He missed a couple of games in there, and he also just didn't have any sort of big performances. Yeah. And anyway, he's uh, he's back to much closer to what we have grown to uh, expect. What, Bruce, is your bad thing? Okay. Well, I'm going to go with the uh, third Vegas goal. And this one that tied it up briefly at the beginning of the second period, and it was just that point in the game where you're thinking, geez, we're going to need to score a lot of goals to win this game. And in the end, the Oilers did score a lot of goals, but uh, <clears throat> this was Vegas's really last hurrah. And it was a uh, um, uh, just kind of a mess up by uh, young Philip Roberg, who got into this game uh, to uh, as a seventh defenseman and was a very sort of minor factor in the game. He played 10 minutes and 10 seconds as a seventh D-man with no stats whatsoever. Uh, not even, a, you know, not even a minus one from this goal because he was a plus for one of the Oilers' goals. That, uh, uh, but on this one, he had the puck uh, behind the net and Phil Kessel was sort of battling for the puck and, and uh, Broberg was trying to pass it out of trouble and rather than sort of go the safe way up the short side boards, which he was on the right side behind the net, he tried to pass it through Kessel. And Kessel's stick was from his effort, and he was down on the ice, but his stick was absolutely flat on the ice, the shaft of his stick. And Broberg's attempted clearing pass hit that stick of Kessel's and caromed right in front of the net just to one side. And then it hit another Vegas guy on the skate and bounced right in front of the guy who was able to stuff it home. And it was probably as much bad luck as you could say it was a terrible play. Uh, but these sort of rare opportunities that he's getting to play are big times and big minutes and big shifts for Philip Broberg. And have, you know, bad things like that happen is, uh, you know, not good for, you know, his chances to... to uh, uh, see more ice time, and unfortunately, his standout play from this game, I think it was okay otherwise, but his standout play from this game was this mistake that led to the 3-3 goal early in the second, and they dialed back on his ice time, and I think he did probably see most of his time down uh, down the stretch in what was clearly garbage time the last 10 minutes of the third period, where yeah. both teams were visibly playing out the string. Still good for him to get on the ice then. It just yes, gets, absolutely. Gets, gets his confidence back. He's, he's um, yeah, he's, I, I gave him a five because I just didn't feel like failing anyone in that game. And it was just yeah, one play. As you say, it was mainly bad luck. And I, I, yeah. I think I kind of agree with that. It's It, it was, a, you know, at least half bad luck. And he played otherwise just fine. He was, he was, he's a... Uh, anyway, we'll see. You know, it's interesting, his development with the orders. I, I, I think the good news is that Unlike some Oilers fans, Ken Holland does have patience, real patience, yeah. Yeah. and will take his time um, yeah. developing this player. I mean, um, my bad thing tonight is Bouchard, his play on the play on the wall in the power play where he gets beat on the wall and they go on a breakaway and score. I mean, this is a player, Bruce, that has been, you know, you could say they rushed. Some people will say they, the Oilers rushed his development, like they, they brought him up initially for a month. Um, when he was a rookie, just drafted, and but he did go back to junior that year, and in a way they haven't. They once Holland came on the scene, at least, I think they've handled his development really well, and um, he is he is a lightning rod with Oilers mm -hmm. fans. He's yeah. one of those players who has a calm demeanor on the ice, which which some people will say is all too calm. Cuts both ways though. When you need mm -hmm. someone to make a a great stretch pass or fire off a good shot. His calm it allows him to do it. I mean, he makes he made some laser. He made a laser shot. He made some really nice passes this game. He, uh, but that you know that same kind of calm can be seen as being lackadaisical on defense. Mm -hmm. 
we all see that now. Lollygaggers. Yeah, he he just makes the the tip of some people's boot itch, yeah. and he always will. That's yeah, the kind of player he always will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's consistently more good than bad with Evan Bouchard. That was really bad. The ratio is getting was, better, and the ratio is getting better. That was really bad though, and. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they're going to get. I think they're going to get it right with Philip Broberg because they got it right with Evan Bouchard. And you, you know, the rightest thing. And some people would really resent me saying this was trading Tyson Barry away, giving Bouchard the stage, giving him the the promotion when he was ready for the promotion. And it was a key move in terms of this hockey club. It brought in a, a absolutely crucial player in Matthias Ekholm, and. Um, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, at the time that they should trade Barry. I know, like, I, we were talking about it, and you, you didn't think they would make that move, as I recall, like, for Barry. And I just thought, well, they might. You know, that would be the, that would be, you know, you talk about money, money ball, like, make the most out of a player. This is the move. Like, this is it. And you, even though Tyson Barry is such a key part of this team, that was the moment that you promote. You, you throw in on, you throw, you know, you make your bet on Evan Bouchard and you make it on Ekholm, even though you're giving up a, such a solid veteran player in Tyson Berry. So I'm glad they did that. And um, there's, there's my long and rambling discourse on Evan Bouchard tonight. Well, the timing appears to have been right. And some of, Bar- of, of Bouchard's fiercest supporters, like my friend Tyler Hufka, for instance, would say they should have done this a year ago or two years ago. He always believed in this player and that. And, and some people were really upset during the uh, uh, during the silo season when you had the four divisions that didn't play against each other at all. And Bouch was with the team all year, either on the team or on the taxi squad, because he was a guy that could move back and forth without waivers. Uh, but he only played 14 out of the 56 games. And some people were saying, well, that's just negligence. He should be playing every night, and, you know, and there's a case for it. Uh, but from this distance, the case can be made that uh, they didn't necessarily do it wrong. I mean, he got lots of time during that season to be basically Tyson Berry's understudy. And last season, more of the same. They they started fitting him in more on the power play in this season. And I, I think the good news is that He's only been scoring since Barry got traded, so his box cars, when it comes to negotiation time, are not going to be what they might have been if he just started the season on this power play. Yeah, so he's basically scored a point a game since uh, since the trade. I think 13 points in 14 games, and now he's finally starting to score goals again. Just a wicked snipe last night, another wicked snipe tonight, and I'm. It's great. I mean, we knew he had that shot. It's kind of been missing in action, but it's nice to see it coming out of hibernation, and I expect to see more goals uh, coming off that stick before uh, before the year is done. And he's, you know, once he did get this opportunity, he's ready. And, I mean, they gave him a golden gilt-edged opportunity with a new partner, more ice time, and a power play opportunity all together. And for the most part, he's been crushing it with the occasional 10 bell error. So that really was bad. That he was reminds bad me of Paul Coffey. Paul Coffey used to do that kind of stuff. And there were oh, people yeah. that said Paul Coffey was the worst defender in the league. And they got all over the, you know, this mistake or that that cost the Oilers a goal. And at the end of the season, I'd be going, well, look at Paul Coffey, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's defensively, he leaves a lot to be desired. Offensively, he got 120 points and he wound up plus 50. It sounds to me like he probably made 50 more good plays than bad. You know, I mean, you're coming out on balance ahead in the count. And sometimes with that type of player, you got to take those mistakes as a cost of doing business. Instead of ripping the guy apart, you're going to hope that he's going to make up for it. And in fact, Bouchard did on the very next play. He was he didn't get a point, but he made a very nice keep in at the at the blue line, that set that that uh, Nuge to, to McDavid to Drysaddle passing play in motion, uh, and they got the goal right back. In fact, one very cool thing: the last two games, the orders four times they gave up in the first period: two goals in in Arizona, two goals in uh, Vegas. All four times they scored a goal themselves within a minute of uh, of the other guy scoring. Within one minute, Edmonton had, had responded in kind with a goal of their own. So that's uh, that's a good uh, bounce back. 
I think the Oilers, Bruce, would have traded Tyson Berry last summer um, to, to get cap space. Mm-hmm. But when Duncan Keith retired, it changed everything. Yes. Suddenly, they suddenly needed a more veteran defenseman. They, at that and time, they had they some cap space because of mm-hmm. Keith being gone. And they had some cap space because of Keith and then Smith um, going on LTIR. So that changed things. I think, though, they, de- they, they definitely would have given Bouchard the chance um, from September on. And um, but they needed Barry. They just couldn't get a better veteran defenseman at that point than Tyson Barry. And finally, Ekholm sh- shook loose um, at the at the trade deadline. So, and you're right. It, it does make a big difference because if Bouchard was, let's say, like a 70 point player this year, um, he'd be signing for a lot more money this summer. We and it's for eight or nine million. In the next well, year. maybe you never yeah. know. Eh? So, yeah, yeah. so. It's good the way it's worked out. I mean, we'll see how, if he has a big playoff, which is in, entirely likely, he could still cost a pretty penny, and I think he will, but we'll see what it, we'll well, see how, how it all plays out. They try and lock him down, and of course, how much restriction they have from the salary cap to do everything they want, uh, which typically is a lot. Uh, but uh, he's uh, uh, he's coming on. Tyson Berry, you know, one of the things Tyson Berry did was uh, people hated that $4.5 million contract. Well, that was a placeholder. And when it came time to trade for Ekham, uh, they didn't need $6 million in cap space. They only needed one point five because they were trading four point five the other way in Barry, and he was a tradable asset. It wasn't something where they had to attach draft picks just to get rid of the contract. He was, uh, you know, he was value. And so they got... Uh, uh, they just needed to top up the cap space, which they did in the Pulley Harvey trade, but most of the cap space for Eckholm came from Barry. Indeed. What is your number, Bruce? Yeah, I'm going to go with the number 41 and also number 10, uh, which is a number of goals scored now by Darnell Nurse after he pounded home the goal that put Edmonton ahead to stay and looked for a long time like it would be the game winner of this game. Uh, with a rocket shot from the sideboards through a screen that overpowered um, uh, netminder Jonathan Quick. And that was not only uh, his third 10-goal season of his career for Darnell Nurse, uh, but he's also um, uh, tied now his career high in points uh, with 41 points. Uh, he had a similar season, 10 goals and 31 assists for 41 points in 2017-18. I think that's a while ago. Uh, and since then, he's had 33, 36, 35, 36. Some of them shortened seasons. Last season, he had injuries that shortened his season. And right now, he's just played 70, I guess, 75 games, and he's got 41 points. You know what? He's scored points now in 14 of Edmonton's last 19 games. He's got a six-game point scoring streak on the go. Uh, he's got a big plus now. What is it? Uh, so, a second, I'm going to bring up Edmonton. And he is a uh, big plus of uh, well, plus 19 on the season, tops on the Oilers. And then if you look at defensemen around the league, here's the cool thing about Darnell Nurse. He's got 41 points, one point on the power play. One point on Edmonton's power play. He doesn't play the power play. That's for guys like Tyson Barry and Evan Bouchard to rack up the points. But he's got, uh, uh, at even strength, 37 points, shorthanded three points, power play one point. That's how he got to 41 points. And if you look around the NHL as a whole, uh, even strength points uh, for uh, all franchises. Defense. Hang on for a second. Let me see what I didn't do. And he's got uh, uh, 37 even strength points. Uh, he is seventh in the NHL. Uh, one behind Adam Fox, who's in sixth. One ahead of Kale McCarr, who's in eighth. Uh, that's a lot of even strength points for a D-man. I mean, Carlson's got 69, and he's way off on his own island. But after that, it's like Don Morrissey, Hamilton, Hughes, Fox, Nurse, 
Makar, Darlene, Taves, Yossi, Petrangelo. That's the top 12. Some pretty good D-men in there. And then there's that no good 9.25 million overpaid guy, Darnell Nurse, that's somehow on that list. It's all because of McDavid and Dreisaitl. But you know what? He's not bad. And he's getting better. His, his game, I think his game has gotten better since uh, Eckholm arrived. They have a more equitable distribution now, top four minutes. Uh, you know, they got another D-man who's capable, you know, it's not Nurse and three young guys, and he's got to do all of the heavy lifting. All of a sudden, now the Oilers have a real top four, and that has the effect of making uh, Nurse and CC more effective. And also, uh, <clears throat> of course, Yossi and Bouchard on their own are very effective. And all of a sudden, Edmonton's 11, 2, and 1 in those 14 games. He had, he, at even strength, Bruce, he's averaging 1.5 points per 60. Uh -huh. which is good of uh, regular defensemen who've played more than 400 even strength minutes. He's 16th in the NHL. So he's just behind Adam Fox and Hapis Lindholm. And he's mm -hmm. just ahead of Roman Yossi, <laughs> Devon Taves, and Rasmus Dahlin. Wow. So not, not bad. Not too bad, all you nurse haters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's, I mean, he is a beneficiary of the team he's on. It's a high-scoring team, but he does contribute to the high. He's, just, he's not just collecting points because he happens to buy osmosis. You know, he's making plays. He's making shots. And now he's had double-digit goals three times in his career. It's not a fluke. And he's not racking them up on the power play even a little bit. He's, you know, he's earning those points in uh, uh, even strength or even shorthanded situations. So... Time to give him a little love, I say. Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> I wish that he was just a slightly better defensive hockey player, like slightly better reads and slightly, you know, more of a shutdown He's guy. Yeah, I do. But he really is a dynamic attacker and a d dynamic defender. So um, yeah, I'm 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 good with I'm good with that deal. I don't have a big problem with it. Bruce, I'm just gonna go back. Um, I was gonna give a different number, but I'll save that one for later in the season. But I'm going to, like, uh, yesterday I talked about the Oilers were tied with the 1977-78 Montreal Canadiens for the best power play of all time. Now they're, they got the toe hold on, they got the, the hold on number one. The Oilers percentage this year, 32.7%. The Habs at 31.9%. So, um, fingers crossed, Bruce, that uh, this is going to be, go down in history as the greatest uh, power play of all time in the in the regular season. I wonder what it is in the playoffs. I'll have to have a look at that. But um, I'm guessing on the 80 Islanders that we talked about the other night with 16 goal power play goals just in the finals. I'm guessing that you are correct. Yeah, but that's only one series out of the four. Yeah, let's here. I'll just quickly get that number. It is the. Uh, is this is something screwed up here. Power play percentage. I can't find it. Here we go. Well, it's the Colorado Avs of 2020, 20, 2021, but they only played 10 games. So two series, it looks like. They had a 41% on the playoff power play. The 1980 81 Islanders in 18 games had a 37.8 power play percentage mm -hmm. so um you know if you try to I, I didn't do a search so that's the best uh, of a team that went 80, 81 the islanders okay 80, 81 islanders <clears throat> one they thing were, bouchard did tonight was he finally became the sixth oiler to score a power play goal this year he's replaced tyson bear and he's finally hit the score sheet with as a goal scorer for all of the orders lead the league in power play goals with uh 84. Uh, the power play goal scorers are Dreisaitl 29, McDavid 21, Hyman 15, Nugent Hopkins 14, Barry 4, and now Bouchard 1. So it's just this first unit doing all oh. of the power play scoring. All of it. All right. 84 goals, because Bouchard now is on the number one power play now that Barry's gone. What a group of Unreal, players. Right? Yeah, it's really, we're really lucky to have, to be able to watch this night in, night out. 
Bruce, let's leave it there. We got a game Thursday to watch, I guess. It's the Kings who lost the Calgary Kings. tonight 2 1 Good. in All regulation. Right. So, big night for the Oilers. They gained two on both Vegas and Los Angeles tonight. Bruce, thanks for talking. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.